So I'm Zach. I'm Adam. And this is Looking, Looking at, at Cinema. cinema. Mm, like butter. We could be on <laughs> NPR. We got we that could. smooth, <laughs> silky voice. Yeah, we do. So I think we looked at multiple cinemas. We did. So what we're doing is um, looking at some of the most popular movies of the week or the month or whatever. There's that fly. I <laughs> There's a fly it. in here. Um, Look out for him. It's an <laughs> Easter egg for you viewers at home. We're looking at um, what we think is the most popular movies of like the week or the month or, or whatever and um, kind of watching those and looking at kind of telling what we think based on our personal opinions of movies, mm -hmm. uh, what is kind of worth watching, what's worth skipping, and what you could watch something else and have a better experience. Yeah, I like it because uh, these are not movies I would have picked. Yeah, that, pretty much that's ever. Maybe one of them, but um, yeah, it, it got me out of my comfort zone, and I did enjoy all the movies, I would say, even if I didn't really love them or liked them a lot. But, yeah, uh, I there was I, something to enjoy about. I got them. some enjoyment out of every one of them and it is cool cuz yeah, I can I can be a little bit of a snob about movies and um, Oh yeah. No me too. And I, <laughs> I say that too because I I empathize with that. Yeah, yeah, and say that I'm just I'm not going to watch a movie just because everybody likes it or um or whatever. So it is kind of a fun kind of experiment to kind of make me watch movies that I wouldn't normally seek out. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and it was a cool experience. I think I yeah, like you said, I enjoyed something about all of them. So we're gonna talk about three movies in this yeah. podcast. It's not gonna be as in depth as our, our our other show where we go really into one movie. We're gonna talk about the general synopsis, what we thought about it, maybe dig around a little bit in the uh, metaphors and and plot a little bit, but it's mostly gonna be what are our overall opinions. Um, we sh we won't dive into spoilers too much here. If we do, we'll tag it uh, before we reach that point, so you know when to dip out of that review. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, the three movies we're going to be talking about is Cruella, um, Quiet Place Part Two, mm -hmm. and In the Heights. In the Heights. So uh, we're going to start with Cruella. Let me give you some advice. You can't care about anyone else. Everyone else is an obstacle. So Corello rated PG-13, two hours and 14 minutes. It came out on May 28th of this year. Uh, you can see it on Disney Plus with Premier Access. So with a general Disney Plus account, mm. they're going to get you for an extra $30 if you want to watch it on Disney Plus. Or you can see it in theaters. It was in theaters too? Okay. Yeah. And we actually went to the theaters, me and you, to see one of these movies. That we was, did. I, that I was been fun. In a long time. Yeah. And they thanked us about 600 times on the way yeah. into the movie. You're like, so warm bodies. Oh they really God. want you at the theater. For sure, um, go, yeah. So the movie was written by a few writers. Um, Dana Fox, who wrote uh, Couples Retreat. Tony McNamara, who really hasn't written anything that I've heard of. That was just one of the credited His name writers. sounds familiar, but yeah, I can't, I don't, I don't place it at all. And then Aline Brosh McKenna. Um, who, interestingly enough, wrote Devil, Devil Wears Prada, which we'll talk about later, probably. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. No, you definitely get Devil Wears Prada vibes in this movie. Yeah. Um, and then it was directed by Craig Gillespie, who directed I, Tanya and um, Lars and the Real Lars Girl. The Real, yeah, he did like a Kid Cudi um, documentary or music video or something as well. I definitely, that was something I was going to talk about, too, a little bit, but it connects with that. His. I felt like we were watching a music video more than a movie. Like it oh, kept like sure. pausing, and there's like long, <laughs> no reason that a song needs to be here. But let's just hear a cool rock and roll song for like two minutes while people walk around and that do stuff. makes so much sense because I had questions about that too. It happened a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially the first thirty or forty-five minutes, I felt like almost could have been cut, and they were just constantly montaging it with stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, why? <laughs> it looks pretty, but I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, just to give a quick. Um, overview of what this is. Obviously, it's Cruella. You wouldn't watch it if you didn't have some idea of who Cruella is. That's a backstory to kind of humanize the infamous villain villain from 101 Dalmatians. Mm -hmm. um, did we need that? Did we need to humanize did the villain? We <laughs> Well, we'll find out. Did we need this? I don't know. So, but the story is Estella, um, an orphan grifter um, who always dreamt of making it in the fashion world. So we're already getting um, 
Devil Wears Prada vibes. Oh, yeah. And There's then, a theme amongst our movies, too, actually. A lot of them involve fashion. Yeah, fashion is a big uh, career choice lately. I don't know why. Um, and then uh, she has to suppress her truly sinister personality, um, who she is named Cruella, um, mm-hmm. in order to kind of make it in the world. However, she finds that that side of herself is kind of... Um, uh, an asset when she's dealing with the Baroness, who is her boss, which the would be wrote, uh, um, played part. by Emma Thompson, who you may know as uh, Meryl Streep in uh, The Devil Wears Prada, which was right. almost the exact same character. Well, and that's what it's interesting because she was the Cruella character in this movie, really, because she was the older woman who's the evil villain to Cruella, who will become the e- evil yeah. villain, you know, later on. And that was something that immediately. Which this is going to come back later on. I'm going to bring this up at the end of the review, but um, a lot of this, I feel like it's an Alan Mooreization of a lot of movies and stuff lately, where they not only are you going back to the older stuff from your childhood, mm-hmm. you're making it darker, you're you're empathizing with the weird character, with the villain, and and kind of like fleshing out the world mythologically. Like that, there's a lot of movies that are doing that, and that's uh, I think Alan Moore kind of started that that kind of trend where you go back and like pick out all the little details from the older movie, sprinkle them in there, but give them like a new twist and like make it more of a deeper, you know, human emotion, not just like a little kid. So you know, Alan Moore did that like in his comic books. That's how he started out with like uh, Swamp Thing. And Miracle Man, and uh, even like Batman, he did some Batman and Superman stories back in the day. But that was kind of what he would do: it was revamp it, like take stuff that you knew, but bring it into like the real world, the gritty world. And that was—I felt like that was the vibe they were going mm. for with this. Like, oh, did, didn't t- he write um, that Batman when the joke that kills? Yeah, the killing joke. The kill, the killing joke. You were close. <laughs> <I was> close. <laughs> you were close. I had all the words in there. <laughs> yeah, but that's kind of a trope of his. Is like you know that random character that you'd barely remember from your childhood. Yeah. Pulling that out and then like fleshing out his backstory, making him a coke addict, and like yeah. <laughs> making it like the real world. You know, like. But th- I definitely felt that vibe. And then I'm gonna w- once we get to the end of this, I want to bring back up something else that connects with that. Okay. Vibe. Well, I actually like that um, humanizing of, of villainous characters. Yeah. I like the kind of blurred lines between good and evil and how everybody is kind of everyone's human and they have like reasons for their actions and and exploring mm-hmm. that is really cool. I, I think of like Better Call Saul yeah. as a type of uh, of story like that where um, you look at Saul Goodman from Breaking Bad where he was, you know, this unredeemable character really and then you go back and see his his yeah. backstory of how he became what he was. The problem I had with this movie though is it doesn't really explain much about who she is in mm-hmm. the 100 Dalmatians movie. It's there like were a, Dalmatians in this, Adam. Were you not paying there attention? There were Dalmatians. They and I totally noticed, explain why she doesn't like Dalmatians. <laughs> and Disney was definitely trying to correct some wrongs that they did with 101 Dalmatians, where um, I've, I've always heard that they created the perception that Dalmatians were good family pets, mm. which they were not. They're, they're typically not good with kids. Like hunting dogs? or like I don't know what they are, but I, I know, know that like people were buying them as like their family mm-hmm. pet, and they're just... They're notoriously not that great or patient with kids, and so gotcha. it's not a great family dog it's to like have. It's like the Taco Bell Chihuahua situation where a bunch of people got Chihuahuas because of the Taco <laughs> Bell commercials. This dog is awful. <laughs> not a great dog. <laughs> so I did not know that was a thing. Something about the dogs, though, I really didn't like the choice to do CGI dogs. It really distracted me. Like I got used to it as the movie went on. Maybe they got better at doing it, but at mm-hmm. the beginning, it was really distracting. Although I did, speaking of Chihuahuas, I liked the little Chihuahua in this. He was oh, like yeah. my favorite part <laughs> with the eye patch. He was adorable. Oh, the eye patch was awesome. Yeah, he was a, he was so cute. Um, but the the Dalmatians really weren't a huge part. They were mm-hmm. they were in the beginning and at the end, but for the yeah. most part, you don't really see the Dalmatians. And so, it was for the mythology of the, yeah, the Dalmatian just, universe. Just to make sure you remember, <laughs> oh, this is a part of 101 Dalmatians yeah. in case you forgot. Now there's a Dal- Dalmatian cinematic universe yeah. <laughs> where they have to like get continuity right in all the universes here. Yeah, I don't know. So do you think that they, they pulled it off? Did you empathize with Cruella at all uh, during this movie? <laughs> I almost empathized with her companions more, and we're just like, dude, get away from this crazy. I know, crazy yeah. Lady. I that was the problem with going back to humanize this character and trying to make it um, not a tragic story because mm-hmm. it has to be a tragic story. Yeah. 
Um, and I, I don't know if I'm giving some spoilers here, but you know, she becomes Cruella. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's a spoiler, but yeah. <laughs> um, I think of a villain as, especially when you're trying to humanize them, there's someone who's lost their true self mm-hmm. in some way due to some sort of um, trauma or something that happened to them. They've lost their true self and they're um, trying to, uh, you know, they're, they've just kind of lost their perception of reality. They've lost who they are and that's why they act the way they do. Um, or they've just accepted that they're that they're bad. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't get that from from this movie at all. I felt like the it kind of made Cruella into this great, you know, mischievous character, it's like a folk hero. Yeah, it, and that was the other Alan Moore thing because it's like a superhero. She had a secret identity. Yeah. She was like disguising who yeah. she was. She had like superpowers when she was Cruella. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> she could do no wrong. Like, yeah. And and that was what was annoying about her character was that because she relied on her like henchmen, which weren't their, her henchmen here. They were like they grew up together, mm-hmm. and she they they did so much for her, and she like completely took them for granted. It, it just I didn't buy it. Mm-hmm. Like they helped her out so much, she wouldn't want to cut that off. But her attitude throughout the movie just like screw you guys. Now that I'm Cruella, I don't yeah. need you, and I'm gonna yeah. treat you like garbage. And I just didn't get. That that turn, like there was no, re- like you said, there was no reason for the turn. Yeah, it was just like, oh, she's schizo now, and she's just a different person. Yeah, you know? I, and I mean, there's some reason, there's some explanation in the story like as to why emotionally, yeah. why she does the thing she does, but then why she treats her friends the way she does, and then there's not really a, I don't feel like there's much redemption Mm-mm. for that, and. Um, it doesn't really end on any interesting note either. It's just like now she's Cruella at the end, you know, so. Yeah, and it that, doesn't. That, not really spoiler, you know she's Cruella. Yeah, so. you know, yeah, I won't say anything more about the end. Yeah. You have to watch it to kind of wrap your own head around the ending. It was but. a beautiful movie. Like the cinematography was great. The visual visuals were great. Um, the music choices were great. There was just too much of it. And it was, it, it, how long was this movie? I did not expect. Two hours and 14 minutes. Yeah. I like, we, not don't, we don't need that, that for an origin. No. For a, a Disney villain. movie. <laughs> for like, a Disney movie. It, yeah. It just needed some editing. It needed some trimming. I thought the performances were pretty good. I didn't have complaints about like the acting mm-hmm. or any of that stuff. And, and it had its fun moments you yeah. know, for a kid's. Kind of a kid. It's more of like a young teen movie, I guess, young adult movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I did have some questions about Emma Stone as a casting choice mm. for a British character. Like, why is she playing a, a British yeah. role when and like, her accent's okay? Her but accent it was, was like, fine, why? and a lot of the American actors, like, I could kind of see them their, in their facial expressions, them yeah. trying to do an accent. I mean, that was fine though. It was just like. I, I originally had some issues with why Emma Stone, why not a British actress? Yeah. Can anybody can't? Could there was anybody a lot of voiceover this? which really dragged on, and you, I felt like she got lazier with her accent as yeah. the voiceovers <laughs> went on. You could tell she was getting tired in the studio. But w- what I think they were trying to do with Emma Stone is she already has this um, kind of typecast personality that's easy to plug into a story like this because she has that yeah. kind of lovable personality, Punk rock attitude, but is also like kind of like a sarcastic sinister person below the surface like you always get that in her kind of um character so it's easy to kind of plug her into this story without much development of that um so i was fine with it as it went on i just thought i don't know i had i had issues with cruella being her true identity i thought it would have made more sense if she um if her real self was estella Mm-hmm. You know, because they, I mean, this isn't a spoiler. They established that Cruella is who she is for, at the very it's beginning. It's like her of the nickname movie. her mom jokes yeah, about her having at the very young age. Yeah, it's just like her mean personality that mm-hmm. comes out. And so they established pretty quickly, like, she is Cruella and she's trying not to be. Mm-hmm. But if they had made it to where Cruella was this, this character that came out all of a sudden under stress or something like that, and then right. she became it, then it would make, be a villain story. But this is like she's becoming her true self, which is ultimately what we want to do. But then her true, true self, self is, is someone evil. who wants to kill and skin dogs so that she can yeah. have fur. And, and we're supposed to like her at the mm-hmm. same time. No, it didn't, didn't really work for me either. She's like the inverse of Superman. You know how like Superman is a, he's a g- hero, obviously. But his disguise is that he looks like a normal person and his real self is Superman. 
That was like she was like born with the messed up hair. Right. She was like born Cruella. Yeah. But then she would wear the disguise of like a normal Estella or mm-hmm. Estrella, whatever her name was. I forget. Estella. Uh, Estella. So it was like this weird inverted like superhero evil yeah. thing that going on. Yeah. I, I like I said, I didn't it didn't feel earned. Um, is it what's your overall review of this movie? Do, you, do we want to give number reviews? What do we? By the way, in the comments, if you prefer something, let us know. Yeah, we're, we're, if there's a number, if a number value, it'll be maybe completely... just give it like a the like gladiator like <laughs> oh, yeah. up or down, or you could keep it in the middle. I guess. Yeah, I I don't I don't know that this movie has a whole lot that's worth seeing. I think the interesting parts of it you could see mm-hmm. in Devil Wears Prada. If it was an hour and a half, maybe, but like, man, two hours, yeah, twenty minutes, like, jeez. I wasn't checking out of the story though. Like, I guess, I mean, it kind of keeps you. It has a good flow. Keeps you in it, so it flows. It's it's done. It's fine. That that's my assessment. It's fine. Mm-hmm. Like, um, it's fine. It's if you have two, road. if you have two hours and fourteen minutes to kill, it's fine. Um, but don't ex- if you're a diehard 101 Dalmatians fan. Um, if you're out there, <laughs> you're gonna have questions about yeah. uh, about this movie. It's not gonna answer. No. It's gonna create more questions. It's than not it like answers. there was any yearning, burning that people had. Like I need to understand <laughs> Corilla yeah. and why she hates Dalmatians <laughs> specifically. <laughs> you know, like it was just it, no one needed it. No, <laughs> no one needed it. No, no. It was. I mean, I could get into um, the money machine that is Disney. And um, I'm sure it'll come up a lot in this podcast. Yeah. How- Speaking of which, <laughs> and this kind of ties into the uh, our addendum to Corella, which I'm going to connect back to Alan Moore. Maybe minor spoilers here. If if there are, I'll put a little notice here to like skip ahead. But there's there's a book. So I'm sitting there watching this movie, and the first thought that goes in my head was what I said earlier about oh Alan Mooreization. They're going back, revamping, blah blah blah. Then about halfway through the movie, I'm like, this plot feels really familiar. Like, I don't know what it is, but I feel like I've seen this, like, archetypal story before. And it's not like, there's not a whole lot of, like, fashion designer war movies that I can think of. Yeah. <laughs> but then I was like, why do I feel this way? And so then I'm, I remember this really random, weird book by Alan Moore. Oh, weird. Called Fashion Beast. <laughs> <laughs> that just, and if you, if you want to, I'll put some, like, clips up to the viewers but I, I highlighted a couple moments in the, and if you want to look at it okay. but like visually like it's very similar it's like a dark um, and actually he says he wanted to make this ba- based on um, Beauty and the Beast so it follows that archetype and the punk rock thing because that's also part of the movie He this was actually supposed to be a movie that he turned into a comic later on when the movie fell through mm-hmm. and it was a movie he was making with uh, hold on Oh, well, they snatched the, the drawing pad. The same friggin' <laughs> thing. But no, uh, he Alan Moore was making this with uh, Malcolm McLaren, who you may have not have heard the name of, but he was like the producer, um, behind-the-scenes guy running the Sex Pistols, running like the um, New York Dolls, like the whole punk rock scene of the 80s and the fashion of it. Like mm-hmm. He was like the one that created the fashion and trends. And, uh, okay. and he wrote this book with Alan Moore, which was supposed to be a movie that never got made into a movie. But it's a, it's very similar. It's a fashion war. It's someone obsessed with like a rich, eccentric old person who oh, is a fashion wow. designer, and they want to be them. Uh-huh. And they end up wearing his clothes. Um, and there's like this sort of battle that's going on that ends up like... The dog. You know, there's even the dog. That's why I highlight the, the freaking Dalmatian. Wow. It's like a Dalmatian, too. And if you look, um, there's a there's a necklace, too, that's in the movie. And there's a neck. Just look on the cover here. You see that she's wearing the same exact necklace from the, the movie. So I, I feel like there was some someone new of this and that was on that One of these three writers production. has read this... this uh... And I, it, I think it might have been a Disney thing because he even mentions in there, Alan Moore says he wrote this, or they wrote it together based on like Beauty and the Beast archetype. And I wonder if Disney was like, fine, you're going to use Beauty and the Beast. We'll just use your movie for one of ours. <laughs> so very weird. If you want to look this up, I'll, like I said, I would have showed clips, but Fashion Beast, not my favorite Alan Moore, probably one of my least favorite things he ever did. <laughs> but that's why it just poked out of my memory. And I was like, wait a minute. Like, this is not original. <laughs> Hold up a sec. But yeah, that's that's crazy. 
Um, I swear I won't shoehorn Alan Moore into every discussion, and, but it, it was very relevant, and it, the weirder, it got weirder and weirder the more I looked at it, so I had, I had to bring it up. Yeah, but it's not like, even if it didn't directly come from this, it's not like yeah. most of this movie isn't derivative of... Like, it's very derivative. So it's... And that, you're not watching this movie because you're a huge like fan of of cinema and interesting stories. Disney doesn't put out really compelling stories. Um, Not anymore. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Disney themselves, I think, is always going to put out what they think you want to see because they're going out, going for, you know, whatever's going to make the most money. And that's why they're going back on these old, successful um, childhood stories because of the nostalgia Nostalgia. aspect of it. And you're going to go see it no matter what, whether you... Are really all that interested? You somehow like? Oh, I remember that. Yeah. I, that's something I can jump into, and um, that's kind of what they're going for. They're going for like the low hanging fruit. I feel they like. are. One of the movies we watched was a musical, and I did not realize it was a musical until it started, <laughs> <laughs> which was, uh, threw me off a little bit. But uh, Disney used to make great musicals, and you know I'm not against musicals, and I love good music and and cinema, you know, combining the two. So I mean, uh, that can be great, mm-hmm. but uh, Disney doesn't do that anymore. Like they don't they don't hit me in the in the feels like it, they used to. Right. Know? Well, when was the last? I mean, I, Lion King obviously was yeah. a, a great musical. Their animated movies were all I, musicals. They were. I think the last one they did that was a straight animated. Musical was the Frog Princess Frog, the Frog yeah. and the Princess, which I saw in theaters. I did too at your theater, just because I knew it was going to be the last Disney <laughs> musical. Basically, at the time, it's all gone CG, you know, since then. But even that was a fun movie. I wouldn't say it was like one of the greats, but you know, I I love the the artisanship that like goes into a full a full fledged like hand drawn movie you know mm-hmm. I, I love it you know and I, I wish i wish disney would go back to its roots but i don't see it happening anytime soon yeah <laughs> they're just a giant conglomerate now that's buying other companies and properties and mm-hmm. you know they they own everything <laughs> but I, I i don't i don't necessarily want disney to even go back to that just somebody should fill that void mm-hmm. like i don't, I don't know. disney probably owns the rights to animated musicals at this point <laughs> You YouTubers is like the them. closest you can get now. <laughs> you have yeah. to go through. Yeah, they copyright animated. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Is that animated? You're gonna have to pay us a royalty on that. Are there moving images? Oh, sorry, I can't do it. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that was that was a fun time, and the mm-hmm. the songs were great. Like I, growing up in the '90s, we all have like this like kind of emotional tie to the songs from yeah. Disney. Oh, and for sure. um, Lion so, King was like right when I, I was uh, probably six or seven when that came out, and oh, I remember being on the playground and like playing as the Lion King and like my crush. I'm like, you're gonna be Nala, you yeah. know? Like <laughs> that's that's what we did. Like it invaded <laughs> you our have lives. To pin me, <laughs> yeah. No, pin me. Come on, you have to, part of wrestling. The movie. <laughs> but uh, no, seriously, you know, you you come into this stuff as a young kid, so it does affect you. And that's I feel like Disney's given up on that, and they're just like using that that they have from your childhood now to like string you along mm-hmm. and there's not with the Star Wars now that they own and all this other stuff they're just mm-hmm. ooh, we know we don't have to put much effort because they're going to come pay us no right. matter what yeah so I mean obviously there's there's definitely some entertainment value to Cruella um, it's it's is it not like a high achievement in the world of cinema it's not a movie veritas no <laughs> but it's it's a movie um, the story is, um, you know, followable, if that's a word. Yeah. Like, it wasn't can, like a bad movie. Yeah. It was just very meh. Yeah. You know, there was no one vision. There was no like singular thing behind it. It was just like a mishmash of nostalgia mm-hmm. and like pop culture and Alan Moore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was pretty much. And the, and the writer of Devil Wears Prada. And the, no, that was a big the, influence. <laughs> yeah. And the and the lead star or one of the lead stars from Devil Wears Prada was also in this movie. So was it, what wasn't the older woman was in no the, no oh, it was wasn't? it was Meryl Streep in Devil oh. Wears Prada. This was Emma Thompson. I'm sorry. So um, forgive me for not knowing. No, my they're very older they're, actresses. <laughs> they're two. Different I'm gonna, I'll people. cut this out so I don't. Want them. <laughs> anyway, Adam, what's our next movie? <laughs> but I think she even had like the bald sidekick guy, like from Devil, who like oh, was yeah. Stanley Tucci in uh, in Devil Wears Prada. Oh wow! Yeah. So. Um, yeah, definitely some influence there. Um, Just I know we're done with the movie, but that annoyed me because the whole movie was about giving 
you know, like a deep characterization to a e evil character. But then this movie had its own evil character that it gave no deep characterization yeah, I to. I imagine about 20 years we'll get a Baroness story. <laughs> that no one cares about. That no one, like, yeah, they'll have to remind us what it what yeah, it goes to. Like 10 times removed. Yeah, she'll show up in other Disney movies just so we remember who she is. And then in 20 years, they'll give us a backstory on her. That's the movie we need. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So that, be ready for that in uh, 2041. Yeah. <laughs> the Baroness. When Bitcoin's worth $2 million and that movie's coming out. I look forward <laughs> to that. Don't worry, there's lots more bad things coming. Perhaps. Let's go ahead and move on. What do we want to do for our next one? In the Heights. That's it. No story. All right, all right. Everybody sit down, sit down. It's a story of a block that was disappearing. In the Heights. We're talking about In the Heights now. All right. I'm going to add some music behind me now. No, I probably won't. That's just going to be me <laughs> sounding really stupid. All right, In the Heights. It's uh, rated PG-13, two hours and 23 minutes. Um, it was released uh, June 11th of this year. You can see that on HBO Max. I gotta get some water. Um, I can't remember the date, but I think there is an end date for when you can see it on HBO Max. And it's also in theaters, so um, that's also an option. Uh, it was written for the screen, and I'm going to screw up this name. Uh, Kiara... Alegria Hudez um, adapted it to the screen, but it was originally a Lin Manuel Miranda play and musical um, who wrote all of the, you know, the whole thing. This was pre Hamilton, um, kind of his first big break into, into Broadway. Did I miss anything? Nope, just the overview. Okay. I haven't even, I just uh, screwed up somebody's name and I'll, I'll probably get. Nice. Some, I'll put a laugh track some. behind that part. <laughs> and then it was directed by John M. Chu, who directed Crazy Rich Asians, which I did not see, but I heard it was really mm -hmm. good. Um, I watched some of the previews, and um, it kind of had... I don't know why yeah, I'm talking about it. this guy also directed a Justin Bieber movie. <laughs> oh, yeah, he And G.I. Joe, 2013. And uh, Step Up, 21. Or, I'm sorry, Step Up to the Streets. Step Up to... Step Up to... Step Up to the Streets. The Streets. Yeah. The wordplay, though masterful which you know and i'm making fun uh, but like based on that resume i would not have expected this movie to be as good as it was like it was a it was, for what it was you know it was a good job so i'm making fun of you chew i'm sorry but i got nothing against you because you know you did a good job with well this crazy one. rich asians was apparently like a, like i mean i know it was super popular i don't know much about it i just remember i saw the preview and i was like ah that doesn't really look like something i want to see um it just I don't know. Just didn't touch But on everybody that. loved it. And that yeah. and then, you know that probably is that propelled a, my Is that a musical too or no? I don't think so. But that yeah. also probably propelled my uh, desire to not see it was because everybody loved it so I figured I'd hate it. You know, I should give it a shot cuz Yeah, maybe we'll watch that one and and yeah. talk about it. Um but um the overall summary, so this is the film adaptation of Lin Manuel Miranda's uh, first Broadway musical. Um so Navi the story is Navi's telling the story of Life in Washington Heights from the bar that his father started in the Dominican Republic. So he tells Washington story, Heights is a place in New York, right? Like a borough? Right. In New York. I didn't know that until so I watched is, this movie. This is so. where um, Lin Manuel Miranda actually oh, grew up. So okay. this is his like kind autobiographical. of autobiographical autobiographical, um, you know, his You did your story. research. I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm nice. I like this. I had heard of In the Heights before. I hadn't actually seen it because yeah, I don't. Yeah, you got me to watch this actually. So, yeah. When did it come out? Just uh, uh, the play? Two, two weeks ago? No, oh, yeah, yeah. Movie? It came out um, June 11th. I think okay. it originally came out in like 2008, though, on Broadway. It's been a minute. Okay. So it's, it's been a while. Um, so um, he's telling the story of purchasing the bar, um, purchasing, his, purchasing his father's old bar in Dominican Republic while he's running this bodega in Washington Heights. Mm -hmm. So he's always had the dreams of restoring that to its former glory. So... Um, him and his childhood friends, though, the story is kind of the, the feeling of conflict they have about leaving Washington Heights in search for a better life and questioning if that if there is such a thing. Mm -hmm. That's kind of my best overview of what the, yeah, the story it's, is it's about. It's really just about characters and their little moments and life moments. 
Um, and th- th- that kind of leads me into my biggest critique with the movie is I didn't really feel the character's motivations through most of the movie. I, I, di- I just didn't. So it's, it would be hard for me to write a summary too because I just like some people hang out and complain about their lives a lot and... Uh, that was that was <laughs> you know, that was a lot of what I was getting from the movie was people com- while complaining about their lives while seemingly from what we're seeing in the movie have a great life with great people around them yeah. they have fun everywhere they go but man life is terrible yeah. do, 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 and then they're just dancing about it like yeah. there was a big disconnect between like what they're telling you and you talk about this a lot like show versus tell yeah they're constantly telling you that their life is terrible and that there's like things set against them while at the same time having a great time and nothing seems to be going wrong. Yeah, and I think that has something to do with the the medium of musical theater, which normally isn't True. isn't my thing. Yeah. Like, and I mean, it's really probably not a lot of people's thing because we grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. Like, there's not a lot of theaters to go mm-hmm. that people bring out new uh, musicals to of people in our area. Like, stuff travels here. Um, sometimes what's the one with the food here where you can go to the buffet and they do the the, the Alhambra the Alhambra but they, which my dad has performed there before I love the Alhambra that's, that's yeah that's it's a dinner theater place it's, yeah, it's and not they very put on you know plays that you know yeah um, there's not like a theater here that I know of that's real popular that people go to and pe- and local people are putting on their own things or people like aspire to get mm. on the stage here yeah. so musical theater is kind of a medium that exists in like the big cities like LA and New York. New York. So um, the cool thing though about Lin Manuel Miranda is the way that he he like writes the music and does the stories. It does make it accessible to a wider audience, which is why they're sure. kind of exploding right now. And his popularity has kind of gone through the roof because he's kind of made this into something that you know the rest of the world can understand. Yeah. Um, but there's some aspects of musical theater that just kind of we have to get used to like the way that it's acted. I mean, I like musical theater. Like, don't get me. I, I even liked like, um, oh man, my, my brain's gonna go blank now. The Uva Luca de Avewa. Oh, ce um, soir. oh, what was that? <laughs> Moulin, Rouge. Moulin Rouge. Moulin Rouge. Moulin Rouge. I yeah. thought that was a good movie, I, and I liked the music, and it had like a darker tone to it, but it still felt, you know, mm-hmm. like a play. It wasn't like. If you watch a movie about a prostitute, it's going to feel grittier and like real in the way that a play or a musical would not necessarily feel. Yeah. Like. So before Lin-Manuel Miranda, you had Baz Luhrmann, who was leading the way of uh, musical theater breaking into movies. Mm. But he was very, very true to the genre itself. Mm. So... Um, Moulin Rouge was a. I actually didn't see it. I can't say that it was good, um, but <laughs> I, I know like it was it. popular, yeah. and so um, yeah, it reached another audience. But it was still very much like musical theater. But the mm-hmm. fact that um, Lin Manuel Miranda's music is different from you know what you typically expect, and the fact that he he uses rap a lot, True. and um, mm-hmm. I and I don't know his composition. Did you really, like the music in this? I do. Movie? I always like his music. Mm-hmm. I definitely like his music. I, I know he did a lot of the music in Moana. I watch that with my oh, kids yeah. a lot. And yeah. that is like, I like to skip ahead to the songs. Yeah. And that. Actually, that was a Disney um, musical. And that was Disney. Well, he wrote all the music in that one, right? He didn't write the movie. He just wrote the music. He wrote, I don't think he wrote all the music, but he wrote a lot of it. And you can definitely it. tell. Like He definitely has a style yeah. um, if you're paying attention to the music. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I have a similar complaint to to Cruella in this one too like I like some of the music a lot of especially at the beginning I just feel like it drags again I don't feel like it hooks us on the characters I felt like actually the lead actors I think are a big problem like uh, I don't I don't know if, if, if you agree but the the main guy and the main girl I felt like were weaker leads than the secondary leads the um, what was it uh, Benny and Nina, uh, Corey Hawkins and Leslie Grace play like the two African American uh, leads that are like mm-hmm. secondary leads, and I like their songs better. I like their motivations as characters better. I felt what, like I f- what felt like when when you get to them like 15, 20 minutes in the movie, I felt like that was a better start than the last fifteen minutes. I was like, why aren't we following these people? <laughs> They're more interesting, and I feel like more like connection to what's going on with them. Yeah, like there was something missing in the like opening music and in the opening like the I didn't like the like 
where he's talking to the kids at the beginning, which is like a bookender of the movie, mm -hmm. like the Princess Bride, where it cuts away to someone telling the story. Yeah, I didn't feel that. It was completely unnecessary, mm -hmm. and I just didn't connect to the characters. So that was the biggest weakness for me, although I enjoyed the music, and I enjoyed the plot once it got going. It just took a long time to get there. And I, the main like dr like drivers of the main characters, I feel like didn't even really get solidified till towards the end of the movie. And I'm like, by now the movie's over. I don't really care. You know? Yeah. Does that make sense? That that's kind of true. I'm trying to think back and think about why the frame narrative was necessary. Um, well, it was like it does, well, it's it, a spoiler. Why we can't, I can't really yeah, say. Yeah, we. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil anything about. There's that. a there's a plot because that story does have a have it an feels ending. Cheap. It doesn't song. feel like it's necessary. It just didn't. Yeah, we can uh, talk about that more in spoilers if we want to go into it. But yeah, let's I don't not know. talk about that now. I I kind of liked the the wrap up of the of the okay. frame. Um, yeah, we can I, we can go a little bit in that spoiler. I thought it I, it kind of went. I, yeah, yeah. We don't want you to talk. We'll too cut much that about off it. later. Yeah. Um, but. But yeah, that, to that, the main story, like I'm yeah. trying to think, like it doesn't. Yeah, you could have you could have introduced it differently, um, and then again, I'm not very familiar with, you know, story structure in a yeah um, musical. Well, and that's what did, and thing. comparing it to Disney movies, I feel like they did that better, where they would get you right into it. There would be a musical number that kind of introduces everyone all at once, mm -hmm. and this movie doesn't do that. They waste a lot of time with minor side characters when they should have been introducing all the main characters. Yeah. Like you don't even meet all the main characters till like 20 minutes in or something and mm -hmm. you're like still meeting new people that you don't really care about yet because you don't even know who they are. Yeah. So it, it feels like mismanaged. Like maybe it worked in a stage production better mm -hmm. than this, but something didn't translate or just didn't hook me, you know, personally. Mm -hmm. It might just be a personal thing, but I think yeah. Disney does that formula better when they when they did it back in the day yeah. of just how to structure a musical so you meet everybody and you know the stakes and you know all that stuff early on. I didn't feel like we got that in this movie, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. So I do agree that those side characters um like the girl particularly, mm -hmm. her story was the most interesting to me. She like, was so charming. Yeah. <laughs> I was immediately in love with her as soon as I met her. The other girl's hot, don't get me wrong. But like her character in the movie just pissed me off continually. And, yeah. and the the other lead, um, Nina was her character, was just great. Oh, I yeah. just fell in love with her. Yeah. <laughs> and her music was better. Like I was more into it. Um her story was most interesting to me because um it was an internal I don't well, I guess it's not an internal conflict that I relate with, but it's a s like it's a story I've heard a lot, and what um, was a, the her internal spoilers, conflict right? is she goes off to college. She comes. Oh, yeah. She's coming back from Stanford, and she doesn't want to go back because a she doesn't feel like her dad can afford that her was, going to yeah. Stanford. He's like basically running like running himself bankrupt trying to pay for her. That was the real reason. Her. Although um, she, there's this whole scene where she gives this story about this traumatic thing that happened to her at college that I didn't think was that bad. I was like, that could happen to anybody. Yeah, like, that was. Yeah, that was kind of um, for the times um, story. Like that was that was kind of like something Disney plugs into a, a story that's like. That's I mean, it was probably in the get. original story, right? Or do you think was there a lot of changes that mm, happened in the? Maybe not. I don't know. There might have been. I, I have no idea. Um, but that was a theme that I feel like kept happening. And there's actually a character. Oh gosh, I don't know her name, but she runs the salon. She's yeah. like the really sassy. Um, uh, I'm not even sure what what race she was or anything, but she she was always bringing up that everyone was like weak and complaining about stuff. Like the power goes out at one point, and everyone's acting like it's the end of the world, but they're all fine. Yeah, they're all just like bored. Based. That's like yeah. the biggest like conflict of the whole movie is everybody gets bored. Yeah, <laughs> like, and I'm like, that's not a good driver for plot. But then the the lady of the salon comes out and is like telling everyone like in the old country, like we would have power outages like every day. Like this is this was normal. You guys are like weak here, and I felt like that was like a theme, and I couldn't tell what side the movie was on really because I the movie like wanted us I feel like wanted us to side with their struggles but a lot of their struggles seemed like they weren't that bad like they came from a really horrible place in another country mm -hmm. and they were doing better here as much of a struggle as it was mm -hmm. it was like way better than where they came from mm -hmm. and there wasn't like 
they kind of resolve that at the end of the movie, but that wasn't really the message of the end. That's where I wanted it to go. Is like, actually, our life here's pretty good. Let's, <laughs> let's make it work. I think what it is is the proximity to Manhattan. Yeah. Um, you're looking at your life versus like the life in Manhattan, and True. so um, and you know your your perception of your life is always going to be based on who has it better. Yeah. And so um, and that. I think that's that's kind of the the mood that he was kind of getting at in Washington Heights, and the and kind of the. The resolution he was trying to make is that you know this is like the best place in the world, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I, and I think a lot of the characters kind of come to that conclusion by the yeah. by the end of the movie, and I don't think that's a spoiler. I think because there's that sarcasm like, throughout the movie, like oh we're on top of the world here heights, yeah. but you know yeah. we're actually at the bottom. You know, so there's <laughs> that like metaphor they play with all the um, but then. The, the I like that the one character who's like coming back from Stanford and is conflicted about getting out because mm -hmm. um, the pressure that her dad is putting on her to be successful, mm -hmm. to be kind of like to be successful on his behalf. She was a feeling like she wasn't going to live up to um, the expectations that the whole area had for her. Like every mm -hmm. when she came back, everybody's like, "Oh, you're you're getting out. You're going to be so great," and all of this and the pressure that that puts on her yeah. to feel like. You know, if I don't, or if I don't want this, I don't feel like it's my choice. And like all of those feelings, and then, you know, feeling like if she does make it out and does like make this life for herself outside of Washington Heights, is she still going to be accepted, you know, where she came from mm -hmm. and feeling like there's going to be some resentment for her success? And then there's yeah. also the people pushing her. Like, I get that. It, it kind of reminds me of uh, Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly. Mm which is um, an amazing album. And it deals a lot with his kind of struggle of getting out of Compton and finding success and entering into this new world that he doesn't really understand, but then also not fitting back into, you know, his old world when he comes back to Compton and not, not being able to connect the two. And um, so, you know, having heard that story before and then seeing that played out in, in this and realizing, you know, that's kind of a universal feeling of, you know, um, of the American dream, kind yeah. of, of trying to pursue a better life, but then wondering, you know, like, what's that going to do to my old life? Yeah. Kind of thing. So. No, that's true. Kind of cool. No, I, okay. Her story was awesome. And yeah, I agree. Like, the main character's story was, yeah, it was, it was all right. <laughs> yeah, the main character's biggest struggle was, like, that they went out to dance and the girl danced with somebody else. And then so the guy danced with somebody else. And then when they tried to dance together, the party ended, and then they didn't get to dance together, and they were mad. And that was like their biggest conflict yeah. throughout most of the movie, which is them being stupid. And it I was, was just probably like, a very real like depiction that can happen. Of, I mean, like, yeah, of a first date where like you're completely <laughs> misreading each other's cues and you get mm -hmm. it wrong. But it's like, it just doesn't work as the driving motivation for like <laughs> yeah. a film or a, a musical, in my in my opinion. Yeah, I it was. I didn't really connect to it, and then yeah, I felt what the other characters are going through more. And I really liked like there is some like really fun stuff the movie did that I wish it did more of. Yeah, like it was like throwaway stuff that I felt like should have been peppered way more. Like. Like the early on, he like gets his like uh, shoe stuck in some gum, mm -hmm. and then like it's stuck on a um, manhole cover. Oh, and it does and like he, a like, turntable. Rah, 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 moves yeah. it. There's like a part. I wrote a couple of things down that I really like. There's a part where like they're singing at, at the salon, and like the mannequins like move and start like singing oh, with it. Yeah. And then there's a really cool part like later on where they're like dancing like sideways on the buildings mm -hmm. and these really cool visual effects that just happen very like sparingly and then it's just like really normal the rest of the time and i really wish there was more of that whimsy and like fun that would have drawn me more into the world and it's just like they were either lazy about it or they just it, it felt like two different movies were ha were like fighting like there's this whimsical movie and then there's uh, this other movie and they didn't really Blend. Like blend together. <laughs> yeah, yeah I like the scene where they were all doing like the hand motions and making like these. Yeah, the showing like these images of what they're they're making. Yeah, um, See, that stuff was really cool. Yeah, that was really that. cool. Um, I don't know. Maybe that was kind of intentional with the the contrast of reality versus yeah. the magic. Um, I could see that, but it didn't happen like at certain time, or it didn't. It didn't happen like, at the right time. They didn't use it in the narrative. That yeah. would have been even cooler if it had been like a part of the narrative, like flow mm -hmm. of when these certain characters are together, it gets magical. Mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, that would have been neat. Yeah, know? but there was just no there. It was just like a random. 
hey, we'll just throw a little spice here. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's like, okay. I mean, any reason? No, just some no, spice here. Fine. You know, I'm just, uh, I've directed uh, musicals before. So yeah, uh, I got some extra time today. I'm going to play yeah. around with this. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, it didn't feel like a vision again or like a connective thing that really brought it all together. It mm -hmm. felt like a mishmash of things. Yeah. Which is unfortunate because I feel like it could have been great. When it worked, it worked. There yeah. were some really good songs. Even one of the older ladies who plays his mom, she has a really cool song at one point. Where I don't, I can't say what's happening due to spoilers. Was it his mom, or his grandma, or someone that he lives with? Yeah, the older yeah, yeah. woman. Oh, okay, yeah. Meet his ma madre, or, or I forgot what he called. Abuela. Called Abuela. Which would be a grandmother. Grandmother. Abuela. See, I'm terrible at other languages. <laughs> I'm sorry. But yeah, she had a great song. There were some really emotional, like, cool songs throughout every once in a while, but mm -hmm. it just didn't all come together for me. But uh, do we any? Do we want to talk about spoilers? Or is there anything else on this one we want um, to uh, hit on? No, we don't need to go into spoilers. I think we covered it um, mm -hmm. pretty well. Yeah, the frame narrative wraps up. It is a story on of its own. Yeah. Um, but oh yeah, did we want to spoil like talk about that narrative wrap up at the end? I mean, it just felt kind of cheap. We don't need to say what happened. It just felt a little cheap. When you see it, you'll know what I mean. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, okay, do we need that? Okay, I by, get it. yeah. By the last ten minutes, you realize where it's heading. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. It's so it's not like it. a big surprise, and you know, if you're following the theme of the movie, you kind of see it coming anyway. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we don't need to spoil it, but I, I think it's I, I think it's definitely worth watching. I mean, I enjoyed it about the same as Corella. I mean, they're kind of similar. <laughs> <laughs> to me, like, I like both of them. I felt like they both could have been shorter and tighter mm -hmm. uh, to be better. But they both they both had great cinematography and cool visuals. You know, it just didn't emotionally grab me mm -hmm. for the characters. Um, I think this will end up being a more important story than Cruella. I mean, definitely. Um, just for yeah. the fact of um, it being in a time where musical theater is coming into film again mm -hmm. um, in a more modern way. So not like the Baz Luhrmann, like mm -hmm. high, elevated, high class kind of, um, you know, uh, celebration of, of the theater. This is more of a celebration of people through musical theater, which is... Um, and the celebration of culture through through musical theater, which is which is unique and different that Lin Manuel Miranda is doing. So I think this is, and I think the timing of this this movie was supposed to come out in 2020 and got pushed back because of the pandemic. And I think right now um, they're kind of pushing it out to capitalize on his um, momentum. Um, I think that's the whole reason this movie was made in the first place was because Hamilton was so successful. Probably, yeah. And then they wanted to, like, oh, if we put um, In the Heights on the big screen, that'll gra grab um, a lot of success. And plus, Lin-Manuel Miranda has a new movie coming out um, later this year. It's his directorial debut. Oh, cool. And it's, a, and it's another one that had been... Um, Is it going to be a musical, too? Or? Yeah. Yep, okay. It was... I can't remember the guy's name, but it was the guy who did Rent. Uh, oh, wrote it. That makes sense. And so, um, yeah. Lin Manuel Miranda directing it, or something like that. I think so. <laughs> I, just made that, I just made that name up. That's it's like a, a that's an amalgam of like different writers. It's a Schwarzenbacher film. <laughs> Schwarzenbacher. Really catchy tunes. That Schwarzenbacher guy. <laughs> I just went but, with it too. I was like, yeah, yeah, that sounds yeah, that's, right. That's, that's that it. sounds like a writer that's name. <laughs> but uh, I mean, and I it feel, it feels like similar genre to like Moulin Rouge, where it's like it's not traditional. Uh, mm -hmm. musical like it's not shot like a play it's shot by using cinema to its full extent with right. crazy shots and crazy art and CG like effects and, and things I just wish this movie had more of that and had more of a, a singular vision which maybe if this director gets another chance to do something after this that's his he can control maybe it'll be better and vice versa with the other the I'm writer. pretty sure uh John Chu is on the rise right now, so yeah. I'm sure we'll see some more. I think cool he's got talent. Him. Like, it definitely wasn't a bad movie. It was just, you know, it didn't hit me in all the right places. But it was, it was good. Yeah, it was a good movie for me. Um, I, I still struggle to enjoy musical theater. Um, yeah. I think I have a lot to learn about, like how to engage with it. Um, but I definitely enjoy this more than other attempts, and I like love the music. The music Is there any great. other uh, musicals you like? 
Out of curiosity. Hmm, a musical I like. Blues Brothers. I wouldn't call that a musical, but it I does know. have a lot of music in it. Are you the police? No, ma'am. We're musicians. Yeah. That is a great movie. Yeah, it, it's definitely, n it's it's a movie with, with songs in it, <laughs> yeah. so it's not... It's not quite the same. There's not um, a lot that I really like either. Like, and I've I've liked some. I I, I want to see. I wish I got to see more in actual like the theater. You know, like going to see like the live productions, oh, like yeah. of Avenue Q or mm -hmm. like um, what was the one about the the Wizard of Oz, uh, or the about, about the Wicked Witch actually, which was kind of like the Corella thing where they go back and and fill out her backstory. <laughs> there was a whole Wicked Witch uh, musical that was had really good music. I never saw that. Oh, actual, Wicked. Wicked. Yeah. I never got to actually see the whole play, so I've never. I know the music from it, but I've never seen. The oh play. yeah, I, I remember that one being really popular. Everyone yeah. having the T-shirts. So and, I mean, I, I'm not against musicals. So, I'm not against you know. them, no. And I definitely like um, Lin Manuel Miranda's stories and mm -hmm. um, and his music for sure. Like I. I, oh, and that was something I wanted to say. Is I love the hip, the where they really got to the freestyle hip hop scene. There's like a part where they're going to like the pool or something, and they're all rhyming. Yeah. And then it, that song felt like the start. Like that should have been the first that, song of the it movie. Really should have. Yeah. Because that introduces you to everyone, and it gives everyone a common motivation. Because they're all like the lottery. Someone's won the lottery, and they're all like excited about it. Mm -hmm. And it connected the whole community in one song. And it had it just was a better song to like kick it off on. I was like that's, that should have been the opener. And that's I, true. Like, that would have been a great opening. I was like, like you could have cut. You don't even need any of the movie before that. Just start us here. Yeah, this thing has happened. It introduces the, all the characters like beautifully. It just felt gratuitous, like the rest. I don't know why. So there's so many good movies that have gotten like edited down by the bureaucracy from from like major studios where, where I'm like, why, you know, that I wanted to see the full thing, but here, like, why didn't anyone edit this? Like, why wasn't someone like, cut it down to an hour and a half? Like, it could have been shorter. But yeah, anyway. uh, well, for a, for a theater, theatrical performance, though, yeah. like to get all the songs in the story, and they're typically longer, so, that's true. but we didn't get an intermission with this, we, we went all the way through, and, and, you know, that's a typical runtime of a movie, but it's not a typical runtime for a story like this. It's two hours and 23 minutes. This is about the same as Cruella, actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, you picked all the really long I know. This week. I didn't when I them. saw them boot up, I was like, oh, that's right. <laughs> They're just what's popular. Yeah. Well, you guys picked them. Why do you have to like all these long movies? What's wrong with you guys? Next up, Lord of the Rings, four-hour edition. <laughs> Lord of the Rings musical. It's a 10-hour production. <laughs> That would be cool. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. I actually, really um, silly. I've only seen the first Lord of the Rings. Oh. That's so a good one. They're, they're, That's a, that would be it's a whole confession thing. time. Maybe when something big happens with that in the news, we'll do like a big uh, Lord of the Rings themed episode or something. Yeah, and I'll have to. I'll be forced to watch <laughs> yeah, them. I'll strap you down. Mm -hmm. We're watching the extended director's cut. Yeah. It's the only way. <laughs> that, that's the thing. That's why I've never watched it. I was like, don't bother watching the theatrical one. There's only four hours long. You got to watch yeah. the eight hour and one. And you don't feel like that, but then you never watch the shorter one because <laughs> yeah. then you're a loser if you do. Yeah. I know the conundrum. Yeah. Next movie is it was good timing because I just you just showed me the first movie. I had just seen it myself. Nice. Yeah. I uh, I don't know why I chose it. Oh, Shh. because this one was coming Shh. out. It's a quiet place. If they hear you, all the way up here too. They can't see you. There's right. They can't hear you. Yeah, that's the whole. What, what was the tagline of this movie? Did it have like a good one, like aliens? Like no one can hear you scream. You know, everyone can hear you scream. I don't pay shut attention up. to the posters the, anymore. They can hear you shut up. Is that they like the subtitle? Shut, <laughs> shut up! They can hear you. <laughs> Quiet place. Shut up! They can hear you. <laughs> shut your mouth. It does. It is a great theater experience because you don't have to worry about people talking in the movie because everyone is instinctively quiet. Yeah. So, so wait, what is this movie, Adam? What are we watching? All right, we're wa we uh, we watched Quiet Place Part Two. We saw it in theaters, like we said. I think we said that at the beginning. We um, did. 
And um, we were thanked about... It was good to be back. Yeah, it, it, was. it had been like two or three years. We actually watched it at a movie theater that we had both worked at, yep. like, uh, which made it even more satisfying. Over ten years ago, yeah. And um, we went back and watched it there, and it was all kinds of feelings, for sure. Um, so, Quiet Place Two, uh, rated PG thirteen, which is surprising. Um, yeah, not quite R. Yeah, um, an not hour more. and thirty seven minutes. Uh, it came out May 28th of this year and it came out only in theaters. So this was supposed to be, this was like the first movie to get shut Pushing down you. by the pandemic. That's why I couldn't find a download of it illegally. <laughs> <laughs> why is the shaky cam? There you go. <laughs> That's why we went to see it in the movie. Because <laughs> I didn't want to watch a shaky cam. <laughs> so it's uh, it was supposed to be out in theaters um, back in you know, early 2020, it got pushed back, and John Krasinski was pretty mm-hmm. adamant about it having a theatrical release, so he Which waited. he thanked us for. He thanked <laughs> us personally <laughs> for. If you go to see the movie in theaters, he will thank you. Spoiler alert. Personally. So, um, when I looked at this movie, I didn't realize, uh, John. it was obviously written by John Krasinski, who was Jim from The Office, um, which, you know, everyone knows that by now. So like, if, you, if you know who John, John Krasinski is, as soon as you see him, you're like, oh, it's Jim. Um, he, uh, but it was, it was also credited with Scott Beck and Brian Woods for doing some of the create the characters. character work, I guess. Yeah, I saw so, that too. I wonder specifically if they just created backstory or yeah, they just kind of helped kind of create the characters so that John Krasinski could use the use them and the. I, they they rolled some D and D characters and like <laughs> used their stats. Like I don't know, would your character be able to uh, the... <laughs> climb up this ladder? Let me roll for it. All right, character development. <laughs> <laughs> so written and directed by John Krasinski, um, is same as the first one. Mm-hmm. So the the first one was, I believe, his debut from yeah. behind the camera in right. any way, like writing and directing. Um, he might have directed some episodes of The Office or something. Right, but him. who hasn't? Like yeah. any, Everybody who starred <laughs> who in The hasn't? Office had directed at least one episode, I think. That's true. Um, like especially once you get into season nine of a TV show, like mm-hmm. the director doesn't even really do that yeah. much. They're just kind of, it's just kind of a credit. That I, yeah, I that was a big I've never thing worked on a TV show. With, I'm just um, throwing that out there. That like started big with Star Trek back in the day. Like all the original Star Trek guys ended up directing, and a lot of them still still do like direct episodes of TV shows and whatnot. Yeah. and directed the movies. Like Leonard Nimoy ended up directing some of the big uh, motion pictures. So mm-hmm. that started that trend, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're like a big film nerd, you get excited about who the director is on mm-hmm. an episode of a TV show, even though it has no impact. Like I remember watching uh, episodes of The Office. Like, oh, this one's directed by Joss Whedon. This is going to be really yeah. good. It's like, oh no, it was good, but it was like every other episode. It was a office. bottle episode. <laughs> oh man, no, he really oh. did direct a bottle episode. No, uh, Ryan Johnson directed a bottle episode for Breaking uh, Bad, Breaking Bad yep. and that was he incredible. Did. All right, um, so in my summary here, I'm going to give a little bit of a spoiler for A Quiet Place, but I mean... Like the original? The original Quiet Place. Yeah. Um, so the story picks up where the first one left off. The families learned that the monsters do have a weakness to the high-frequency feedback from the hearing aid, but now they have to figure out how to survive without Lee, who is John Krasinski's character. Mm-hmm. Um, so they flee from home, and they find uh, Cillian Murphy's character, who I can't remember his character's name. It's but, uh, Emmett. Emmett, yeah. Um, and Cillian Murphy's in this. That was a nice surprise. I did not know he was in this yeah. until, the mo- until I was like, who's that bearded fellow? He looks really <laughs> familiar. It was hard to tell it was him for a while. Actually. Yeah. Um, and so they run into Cillian Murphy's character, and they learn that there's a radio broadcast that Lee hadn't been able to pick up. Regan, who I didn't even actually know her name. That's the daughter. Um, yeah. Millicent Simmons is yeah. the actress's name. She believes that the broadcast is coming from someone, and it's a secret message leading to its origin. And she thinks if she can get to the broadcast, she can broadcast out the frequency mm-hmm. that may be able to fight off the uh, monsters. To save the world. So she... Um, yeah. Well, first off, before we get into this one, what did you think of the first Quiet Place? Did you like it? I did. I liked it a lot, too. I liked it a lot. This is a great way to see it, having just recently seen the yeah. first one, and I had to wait like two or three weeks. Yeah, I, mean, I, I got to see was, I don't know what it was like for Best all of you. Best way to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, um, so Quiet Place came out in 2018, and that was right in the middle of, I had, um, my daughter was just born. 
and I was um, hopping around. I was still working uh, for the movie theater, and I had just taken a promotion and was like, I lived in Jacksonville. I worked in Gainesville. So I was driving an hour and a half to get to work. I would get home at four in the morning, um, and my daughter would wake up at eight, who I had to watch. So I was not getting much sleep or doing yeah. much movie watching when The Quiet Place came out. So I kind of missed it. You just wanted to find a quiet place. I just <laughs> wanted a quiet place of my own. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. So, uh, but I had like everybody was talking about how great it was. It was like it was like blowing up at the at the theater, yeah. and you know, uh, well, when did it come out? Because I don't remember it particularly being. It's not. It wasn't particularly a time of year when yeah, like the movie theater was busy. I just have been out of like a lot of mainstream movies for a while because there's just so much garbage out there that yeah. I kind of just gave up altogether on movies <laughs> like for a while there. So that's that, that's what when I got more into comic books actually because I was just getting more entertainment out of that and finding more like original ideas. There's not a lot of originality in a lot of movies, mm-hmm. but Quiet Place was different. I felt like it was a different tone than like most big, sh- like mainstream Hollywood movies. And not a lot of dialogue. It's it's more like watch what's happening, piece it together yourself. You know. So I really appreciate it as that, not just as a new director, but like different style altogether. Mm-hmm. That's completely counter to most mainstream you know media. So mm-hmm. I, I like that. Yeah, I like that it sets up. Um for like a monster type movie, it sets up very early on a very simple premise mm-hmm. um, that is not hard to understand or follow. And so you know exactly what you're getting into and what kind of struggles the characters are going to have. Yeah. Um, and they so. do a good job building up the stakes and, and setting each centerpiece to, to build like maximum tension. Yes. And that's what the first movie was good at that, but the second one just kicked that to like mm-hmm. 11. Like a ridiculous amount of tension and good like set pieces and design in the writing as far as that goes. Yeah. Uh, the tension was incredible in the second one. I don't remember being like feel like that much tension in the first one as much as there was in the second one. And there's a particular point in the movie where like you're worried about like three or four different things yeah. at there's once. There's so many points that are getting juggled and you're just like they're yeah. all going to start falling at some point. Yeah. Like, what's gonna happen? <laughs> this movie does a really good job um, of immersing you into the world and the reality of what they're going through like more than most horror or like sci-fi movies that I've seen that, mm-hmm. I, that I can think of. They do a very good job. There's like uh, not to spoil the surprise, but at the beginning of the movie, they show a little bit of the history of the world, mm-hmm. and the way that they show that just feels really visceral. Because you've seen sort of invasion things in movies before, or like what happens when the aliens arrive, and they do it so expertly in this movie where you just feel, like you said, the tension and mm-hmm. the stakes and the threat. It it all feels exactly where it should be, and it doesn't come across as fake or forced or anything mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah, the response felt really real. Mm-hmm. Um, Very much so. Yeah. Uh, and th- that that is one critique, I would say, like getting a little bit deeper into our analysis here, but just of the the tension. at There's a point in the movie, like where you said, where there's so many things going on, and like, bravo, they did a great job, but it did feel a little forced at that point where I'm just like, how many bad things can happen at the exact, at the same, exact time, same time? Where it just you feel like the writer and the story writing it instead mm-hmm. of just feeling the moment because you're just like, oh, come on, I see what you did there, but yeah. like, geez, it was good and bad. Like, you know, that's like my favorite part of the movie and probably the part that I didn't like. I can at see the that. Same time. I, I could, I could probably say the same because you do kind of, you do start to think about the way it was written in that yeah. moment. You it was realize almost, that it was just a little too much. Yeah, and I don't want to even say it's like bad. It's just like you can see, like, ah, and I see what you're doing there. Like, I think if he was like a more seasoned writer, he wouldn't like struggle with that. But Mm -hmm. it's still so masterfully done. I can't even really like hate on it. It's it's still good. It's just you feel that tension of like the manipulation of the writer on you, and you're like, ah, yeah. Especially with the baby, there being a baby that's a threat in this movie. You're constantly looking at the baby, like. Is that baby dead? Are you killing this baby? Like, what's happening to the baby? And they're, they, they're always using that baby for maximum, like, stressor on you. Like, yeah. It's, it's very well done. It's very well done. Um, yeah, I, I can see that. And I think, like, a seasoned writer, um, 
maybe doesn't have as much of a like knows how to kind of fight the temptation to show off in in yeah. writing. It needed and a it little did, softer. And yeah. um, it did feel a little showy. Like mm-hmm. um, it was awesome. But I, I can see that you're like again great to see in the theaters. Yeah, you know, if I had seen it at home, I probably would have like nagged it a little bit more. But seeing in theaters, you were just like so in the middle of it that you just went with the ride. Yeah. yeah. Um. So. My my assessment says the for the first one was about family. I felt like definitely um, it was about um, learning to work together and um, rely on each other in order to survive because it was all that they could do. And there were some really yeah. cool moments in that where they... And you, you really know. felt it. Like, these people have lived here for a while. Yeah. Like, you, it felt real. Very yeah. realistic. Um, yeah, I don't know if, like, some of that chemistry was created because Emily Blunt is John Krasinski's wife, so he cast his yeah. wife as his wife in the movie. So there's there, there's definitely going to be some, like, natural um, chemistry there. Mm-hmm. Um, but not in the second one. Yeah, not in the second not one. and. the second one. Away. I guess we can't say why. No, no, I already said. Oh yeah, because yeah, he's, if you, if you yeah, haven't seen the first one, he's not gonna... in the uh, second movie. So, but you don't really feel. I mean, it didn't. It didn't subtract from the movie. You know, there no. was enough interesting things going on that it didn't bother me that he wasn't there. Yeah, but like you said, the family's broken up in this one, so it's more of like a where do we go from here now mm-hmm. instead of like trying to hold the family together. Right. Um, it becomes almost like a superhero story a little bit because she has like this superpower now mm-hmm. that can fend off the 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 monsters at least a little bit. Um, and uh, how is she going to use that power to to help the world basically? Mm-hmm. And that people not really believing in her and her having this vision that other people can't see, you mm-hmm. know. So I I thought that was all handled really well. Yeah, and and it kind of deals with the fact that she's got to leave home mm-hmm. um, for that, like yep, strike out on her own. She's got to strike out on her own, and it deals with the parents' as side of that of letting go. Yep. And um, so yeah, it was it was really cool, and it it definitely um, I'm not a huge I'm not typically a huge fan of sequels, but I felt like yeah. the sequel served a, a good purpose. It worked. Yeah. And tonally, it felt just like it picked right up. It didn't feel out of place or like it didn't feel like a sequel. It just felt like a continuation. Right. Of, I guess that's of, why it's called part two. Like it, it really was, is. Like, yeah. Very much so. Um, I so doing? I don't know. We could kind of wrap it up there. Like it was a great movie. Any, Go see it. Any like, negatives about the movie? Any Anything you didn't like? Um, Critiques? I thought I did when I first saw it. I thought there was something, but I can't remember... Um, Th- that was the main thing for me is just the tension gets a little ridiculous at times right. where it's, it's not fully believable. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other part is there's just like minor plot holes in the, in the original Quiet Place and in the sequel that just break my disbelief of the world a little bit. But it's not enough to like ruin the plot or anything. Oh, yeah. There's like a flood in the first movie that's never explained because it's yeah, it's post apocalypse, so you're not sure what the rules are. Like, mm-hmm. how, how do you have electricity? Do you have running water? Like, you never see running water throughout the whole first movie until all of a sudden there's like a pipe that bursts and they're getting flooded out. That felt a little cheap because I was like, did they just want to raise tension and they mm-hmm. didn't want to explain it? And then in this this one. The the young uh, guy Noah Jupe is the actor. He plays Marcus Abbott, who's the son, mm-hmm. and he gets his foot like clamped in a um, bear trap, which mm. is oh god, you feel that? Yeah, you feel that bear trap. <laughs> but then they kind of like it cheapens it because he's like up and walking around through like the rest of the movie and mm-hmm. like climbing up ladders. Yeah. And I'm like, he would be in so much pain, he'd be passing out right now. Right. They just like ignore little details like that. That's like, come on. To kind of you push the story forward. You could have fixed that yeah. in the writing stage. But again, it's not enough to ruin the movie. It's just little tweaks that hopefully the writer will, uh, what's his face? John, John Krasinski. Krasinski will get better at those those little details. Or maybe this is just his thing. Like there's going to be one plot hole in every movie, <laughs> yeah. but just one, just you know, <laughs> so that it's not ruined by like endless plot holes. Yeah. Hey, I don't know. It, it's this working for him, obviously, because yeah. man, he's very successful. Right yeah, now. and plot holes are not that big of a deal if it's overall a good story, and it was yeah. definitely a good story. Oh, definitely. Um, I I was willing to suspend my disbelief of the fact that the kid was walking around. Yeah, it um, was all minor stuff. The character stuff was all spot on, and I felt none of it felt cheap or unrealistic right. or unearned. You felt all those moments in the movie like really, really powerfully. I think. Yeah.
So that's looking at cinema. That's looking at cinema. That was a long look at cinema. Um, no, so, I felt, whew. yeah, like we said, if you if you want to see something shorter, if you want to see them broken up into um, into individual um, episodes based on which movie we're talking about, so you don't have to watch the entire episode. If you just want to hear about Quiet Place, you have to go through an hour of of talking before you get to it. You kids are smart. You can fast forward. Yeah, you know, you don't care about this movie. Skip to the next one. That's that's the one you want to hear about. <laughs> But uh, no, thanks. Thanks for checking us out. We're gonna try and be putting these out at least weekly, and probably have a couple coming out every week. Yeah. Um, like we're gonna be filming another episode here uh, of another movie shortly. So hopefully you get a couple of these out this week. But um, like, subscribe. We're gonna make our own YouTube channel for this uh, this show as well, so you can pick it up on Logical Shaman, or you can you can watch it on. Um, what are we calling it? It's going to be... Jackknife and Scarecrow Grow Productions. Productions. Jackknife and Scarecrow Productions. And this is going to be uh, looking at cinema. So everyone have a great uh, week and go look at some cinema yourself, <laughs> you rascal. <laughs>